Right, ladies and germs, we're back today with another episode. We've got somebody I'm excited to talk with because he knows a lot about cryptography. He knows about uh, cybersecurity. He knows a lot about of a lot of things. We've got Bruce Schneier. How are you doing today, Bruce? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Uh, we like to talk technology on the show uh, every now and again, so it's good to have somebody who is as legendary as you are. You're a New York Times bestseller. Uh, you recently published A Hacker's Mind, How the Powerful Bend Society's Rules and How to Bend Them Back. And uh, you already, I already love the names of most of your books, but this one is the, one of the most interesting. So if I just go right out, Tell me, why did you originally get interested in, you know, cryptography and cybersecurity and, and all things, you know, computer? What, what's your origin story, Bruce? You know, I actually don't have a good origin story. And it's funny because I'm a privacy guy, so it kind of makes sense. I'm not going to tell you how it all started, <laughs> but I actually don't have a good story. I was always interested in math and, and physics and secret codes and cryptography. So that's probably... My origin story, I, uh, you know, did work on the math and, I, you know, I kind of did math because it's more interesting than people, but, you know, as I'm progressing in my career, it turns out I do more policy. I do more people. I teach at the Harvard Kennedy School. So that actually didn't work out because the real problems are people problems, not technology problems. And technology is in the service of people. So all roads lead to policy. So my idea of using math to avoid talking to people at parties totally failed. But <laughs> it's okay. It all worked out in the end. I have fun at parties, even though I haven't talked to people. So <laughs> well, it's I, good. Even the, you have to be conversational. Math, it may be not so good. But policy, that's a great conversation starter. So do you think that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit still? Like that uh, we are we just playing catch up with some of the regulation against some of the stuff we're seeing come out technology-wise? I mean, of course we are, right? And I think this is a, an actual and unsolved problem for society. How do you get government to move at the speed of tech? I mean, the problem we have is that, you know, tech does things by the time we say, hey, wait a second, you shouldn't have done that. It's been, you know, four years, everyone has a drone, everyone's on Facebook, everyone's using AI, whatever it is, it, it's too late to do certain things. And it's because tech moves faster than policy. No reason that has to be so, but it is so. And it's worth thinking about mm. how, uh, how to move policy faster. You know, when you say, is there stuff to be done? I mean, yeah, right? There's a lot to be done. We tend to have a, a world here where tech is not regulated at all. I mean, so the power center that are these now, you know, tech monopolies don't have any counterbalancing power center, which I think is causing a lot of problems we have today. So, you know, I'm all in favor of getting government back involved in doing their job as regulators, but really being as a counterbalance to corporate power, right? You know, unfettered power in any dimension is bad. It's fair to say that you you would believe in capitalism only if we reined it in supremely and made sure that we didn't have the gaping issues that we. So how do we how do we get to a point and bridge that gap and, and make it so uh, policy can move as fast? Is there you got anything in the bag that we <laughs> we can? Yeah, you know. So 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 this is interesting, right? So let me let's talk about the history. The modern democracy is invented in like you know the mid 1600s. And it is, a, it is a form of government and, and is developed with the technology of the time, right? It is, we all can't fit in the room and we can't all argue. So you need to pick one of us to go all the way over there and pass laws in our name. And fundamentally, it is a limitation of technology that we have to do this. Uh, in the late 1900s, early 2000s, we see the rise of the regulatory agency, which is fundamentally a patch on democracy. Right? Society's getting too complex. We cannot pass laws that match the complexity of society. So we pass general laws and these regulatory agencies do all the work to implement them. Right? So, and that patch has worked for about 150 years or so. Now that patch is failing and we need something else. I mean, I don't have an answer here, sure. but I kind of know the contours of the problem. And you know, I'm a systems guy. I think in terms of systems. So how do I build a system 
for the information age, right? Democracy, capitalism, they were optimized to the industrial age, and they really work. And they don't work that great in the information age. So we need kind of something different. I mean, capitalism is a way of dealing with information problems, right? Nobody can figure out the whole of what to do. Planned economies don't work because there's no in the information doesn't flow. So I mean, we saw this in in socialist economies, right? The, the information didn't flow up accurately, so the rules couldn't flow down in a way that was that that worked. And, and the point of, of a market is that is the decentralized way of having the information flow, reaching optimal uh, market decisions. That works great. It requires a couple things, right? It requires competition among sellers for intelligent buyers. Buyers making intelligent buying decisions forces sellers to compete with each other on quality and price and various characteristics. That works great in an actual market, right? You go down the street to a farmer's market, nobody prices their apples a dollar more than everybody else. I mean, right, right? we all know how it works. That starts failing badly when information's being hidden. Like when you don't have competition, monopolies, and when you can hide true prices. And so a, a bunch of examples of that. I mean, go, I mean, good luck figuring out how much your cell phone plan costs. I mean, you kind of know, but you don't know with all your fees. And those are ways to hide prices. Recently, the US government told airlines, they can't hide prices anymore. They used to you know, advertise a low price and then fees would jack it up. And effectively, that stops set buyers from making buying decisions. I mean, so these are all ways that sellers use tech to try to not have an efficient market. If you have that, market systems work great, but how do we get them to work in these other ways? Again, I don't have answers. I mean, the, the answer is not going to be go back to some other failed 20th century mode of uh, economics, but there is going to be some 20th first century way that's optimized for the information age, not the industrial age, that leverages the tech we have, not just mid 1700s voting technology, like 21st century technologies for, and this is the point, for, for a group to reach a fair, good outcome. And I, I know what kind of adjectives to use. Right? The whole point of a democracy is we're going to harness our disagreements as an engine to figure out what to do. And elections are a kind of sloppy way of doing that, but it's all you could do in the mid-1700s. I mean, given the 21st century, there are probably better ways for us to harness our individual ideas and beliefs and preferences and policy goals to reach some consensus on what to do. Something that maybe isn't as costly. US elections cost about $20 billion to run a presidential election in, in, in campaigning. That's kind of money that's being wasted that maybe we can do something better with. But, but in this winner take all environment, that's what it takes, right? If you want to get your agenda implemented, you need to defeat the other party, right? Why are there just two parties? There's actually a lot of different things we can do. Well, the U.S. system is optimized for two parties. Anyway, it's a lot here, right? Super not realistic in 2024, but really what we want to think about is how do we build these systems to use the technology we have today to solve today's problems, you almost convinced me that if we, uh, the fact that we have all these data points now, and if they were truly uh, for the, you know, greater good of the people, then we could have this Star Trek communist utopia we always wanted. But uh, as long as the corporations wield. I wouldn't call it communist, right? Communist is also a 20th century, you know, late 19th century way of thinking. Okay. And it is suited to the industrial age. If you read Marx, he's talking about workers, workers in an industrial environment. And his thinking, his dynamics are very industrial age. I don't think they work in the information age. I, mean, I don't know what class revolution looks like in the age of Facebook. I don't think it looks anything like, you know, people 100 years ago thought it might. So it's going to be something different. The, the, the answer isn't go back to something else that didn't work. 
the answer is going to be go forward to something that we have no idea what it is yet. That's, well, some people may want a form of kind of techno feudalism, which is an old idea, but they're trying to kind of reinvigorate it and make it sound uh, appealing. That Peter Thiel, people like this, have written, you know, the Dark Enlightenment stuff like this. This doesn't seem like a possibility for you. It, I don't think it's going to work. I mean, it's, there are these kind of libertarian dystopias, right. right? Where the companies are free to abuse everybody with no checks on their power, and that's not going to work. Why not? I mean, there's, there's, there needs to be, you know, the because because the company has gotten too good at subverting the market dynamics, right? Lock in. I mean, so I don't know. It, you know, Coke versus Pepsi. If you drink a Coke today, you don't like it, you're drinking a Pepsi tomorrow, right? That's the way the market works, and that makes sense. You know, you don't like AT&T today, you're probably going to use AT&T tomorrow, right? The cost of switching is greater. Uh, Facebook, right? You know, you could hate Facebook. You're still going to use it because what your friends are there, and where else are you going to go? So those same market dynamics don't work because the information age allows for these network effects and lock-in that subvert the competition. That's just one thing. There's a bunch of things here. I don't think the old ways work. And, and certainly giving corporations all the power doesn't work. Mm. So there needs to be some way that people get a say, right? How do we act collectively as citizens and not just individually as consumers? It's an interesting question. Again, I don't have an answer. I mean, you're getting me kind of like you mentioned, I finished my most recent book called The Hacker's Mind, talking about how the rich and powerful subvert systems. I'm now thinking about my next book, which is kind of how to design systems for the information age that actually work. And are you getting me at the beginning where I'm just sort of describing the problem, but have no clue what the solution is? <laughs> So this might be the worst ever time for this podcast <laughs> interview, but here we are, right? So I'm really good at the problem. I'm yeah. terrible right now as, well, what do you want to do about it? Yeah. But I want something that, so here's my other problem with uh, our systems is their local hill climbing, right? They're incremental so they can get better, but they'll reach local maxima. We'll never figure out how to jump to that peak over there. Mm. You know, we need some way to do discontinuous change. And technology is good at discontinuous change. Policy is terrible at it. Hmm. Again, here's a problem, but obviously don't have a solution. No solution. Uh, but right. yeah, well, you know, and then voting could be, used, be you know, localized onto a, not maybe not Twitter, but something like this where everybody's already on it and you just kind of pass around the policies and people don't need representatives. Yeah, you know, internet voting is a disaster for security reasons, so I can't do that. Okay. Unless I make the voting public. So it is interesting. If, if you can, if you don't want to see, if you don't need a secret ballot, I can make it in a voting secure. That's easy, right? You just publish all the votes. You check if you voted, right? It's easy to do. See, with, with, with voting secrecy, I can't make it secure. It just doesn't work. Hmm. Now, we, the secret ballot is in place because we were worried about voter coercion or vote selling, right? All of those things that were done kind of in the shadows of the information poor previous century. In the information rich current century, all our politics is public, right? I mean, like, there's no, there's no secrecy about who who supports. It's you know, Facebook can predict it based on your posts. So, and, and I, I'm not proposing this because I haven't thought it through. But if you could give up ballot secrecy, then you can do internet voting. Now, does it make sense to vote every week on things? Right? We want to avoid kind of mob rule, so this benefit for there being a uh, someone between you and the policy, right? A, a representative, a legislator. So you don't vote on the policy, but you vote for the person who votes on the policy, mm. because that you know dampens enthusiasms. Mm. But it also brings with it other problems. You have the principal agent problem that your policymaker doesn't truly represent you. It represents, you know, whatever the policymaker wants, uh, you know, minimal, you know, minimal parties. I mean, do we need parties traditionally? 
uh, you have political parties because otherwise you have demagogues. Right. Have you? No uh, surprise. We get. I was going to say, have you? Yeah, we have demagogues. We do with parties, so maybe that doesn't work anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't say, know. Reaction. I have a lot of work to do. I'm telling you that. <laughs> I would say the reactionary nature of human beings and the irrational, fickle thing that allowed Edward Bernays to manipulate everybody into buying cigarettes and stuff is really. Uh, but the hardest part about securing democracy is that reactionary news is just so delicious and we love it. And we have it anyway, though. So, you know, given that we have, so here's my question, and I don't have an answer. Given that we have it anyway, right, whether it, you know, social media and filter bubbles and all the ways that reactionary news and, and reactionary fake news bubbles through our environment, if political parties aren't giving us a protection, against that sort of thing anymore, can we jettison them in favor of something else? So what is what is the 21st century equivalent of the 18th century political party? I don't know. There's something, right? There's a way that people organize that are more organic today. Mm -hmm. Again, questions, not answers. Right. But this is going to be really unsatisfying to your viewers. Yeah. But no matter what, you'd want a technical solution that is more democratic and, and something you'd want something online, but uh, the security becomes an issue. So, yeah, again, I don't also have an answer. I'd like to have guesses what might work, but I mean, maybe you want an AI in your pocket that votes thousands of times a day based on the preferences you have. Maybe an algorithm. Like, I just made that up. Yeah, maybe an algorithm that combs the entirety of the internet and finds out what the general consensus about the feeling of the people is, you know, which... And if it gets it wrong, we'll never know, but I, I for one, <laughs> welcome our robot overlords. But <laughs> I, I think there's so I think there is a... There's some uh, attractiveness in, like, let the AI figure it out. Yeah. But I think that's actually very dangerous. And, I mean, I don't think that our preferences are, like, lying on the ground waiting to be discovered. I think that done correctly, our preferences are uncovered through the process of democracy. Right? It is through the process of engaging with the issue that I learn what I want from the issue. Mm -hmm. So if we step back and say, well, let the AI figure it out, we become kind of helpless. Mm. And it's no longer a democracy. But I, so I, I it's our think, favorite thing to do, though, is to lay back and be, give me death by convenience, sort of, you know? Yeah, I'm not convinced that's that's healthy. Right? <laughs> I think we still have to do the work of a democracy. Yeah. Now, what that means, you know, what civics looks like in this uh, decade in a century, I don't know. But there is there there's there's stuff here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we need to we need to get the hands out of uh, sort of the the techno feudalists and the and the capitalists who are sort of doing the you know like DRM. I mean, what's your consensus on DRM? Is this just the worst thing idea ever, or? No, there's a lot of bad ideas out there. So, 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 so for 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 everybody uh, watching, uh, we just dropped into jargon. Uh, DRM is digital rights management. Uh, this Thank is my you. signal that I've gotten too esoteric, and that we need to actually bring it back to the viewers actually care about. And uh, this is basically software that is used to stop you, the uh, person who owns it, from doing things you might have want to do to stop you from copying the book you bought and putting it on another reader, or even you know using some third-party text-to-speech software because it's easier for you to, uh, to listen to a voice than, than, than read a book. Uh, it's used to stop you from buying third-party ink for your printer. Uh, it's a used to stop you from uh, repairing your own car and, and doing all sorts of things. Uh, it is not the worst thing ever. I mean, there's a long list of things worse than this. But it is a way that corporations turn their market preferences into law, right? Mm -hmm. That HP would prefer you to use HP ink cartridges, but you know they have no way of enforcing that. So you can use every cartridge you want, and somebody can make another cartridge, and, and you can put it in. Just like you can use anybody's uh, windshield wiper blades on your car. You don't have to buy the auto manufacturer's brand, you can buy anybody's. But because there is DRM software in your printer, HP can make sure that those third-party cartridges don't work. And if those third-party cartridges try to figure out how to make themselves work, they are violating a law. And the police go after that. So it's not just 
competition in the market. So this is one of those ways that we started with that companies are using their power to subvert the market. And there's a reason that printer ink is more valuable, like ounce for ounce than I think diamonds, right? right. Because it can be. And cocaine. I know, it's not, actually, I don't yeah. think that's an exaggeration. It's kind of insane. Yeah, no, it's- and This is what you get when you don't have a competitive market. Uh, has there been precedents with laws that have been uh, against us even before DRM kind of existed? Have we ever, you know, been on the lookout for this? This is of? relatively new because because it doesn't regulate behavior, right? I mean, if someone were to pass a law saying you can't use it, you know, I want to pass a law saying that you must use the same car's windshield wipers if you want to replace them. You'd be laughed out of a legislator. I mean, that's ridiculous. You can use whatever wipers you want. You can put whatever wiper fluid, but any gas in the tank. Just, you know, it's your car, you can do whatever you like. But because it's now a computer and DRM was designed as copy protection for basically Mickey Mouse, and it's, it's been subverted for these other uses, the companies can use this old law to do these new things. Mm. You know, and if the car manufacturers figure out how to put a computer chip in windshield wipers and have it talk to the car, they can also grab a monopoly on your replacement wiper blades in the exact same way. So it's new because it requires computer tech to work, and that's relatively new. And it's sort of in the spirit of planned obsolescence, like uh, we need to keep growing somehow, some way. So we're, we'll put a, a heat, sub heat seat heater on a subscription basis for all the new BMWs that came out. You know, these, you had to buy a subscription to have your butt, your buns warmed. Um, but this and, and uh, I mean, Tesla's like that. There are features that they turn on remotely, right? I mean, this notion that you're not really buying the thing, you're licensing it. Uh, John Deere and their tractors are a huge uh, offender in this space. There's like a lot of literature about that. So farmers can't repair their own tractors. And you know, for a farmer, repairing your stuff is like how you grew up. That's part of your identity. Yeah. But you know, the John Deere says, no, they don't buy the software. They just license it. So they have no rights and, and you know, courts have agreed. So moving into this area of software, I mean, it's again, another area where the industrial age systems aren't really working for information age products and services. Right? They're not, not suited to task in the same way. Yeah. Uh, another example you had was, uh, you know, and you've written about this recently on your blog, which people should see, uh, Schneier, Schneier on security, really good stuff. Uh, but you told so Schneier.com, uh, my name's impossible to spell, but if you just type it in even remotely, okay, Google will fix it for you. E-I-E, -E, people, E-I-E. -E. Um, uh, th three vowels in a row, no one does that. Nobody does, but before that was three consonants right in a row, so yeah, it's, it's tricky. I, yeah, I know, don't do it. it <laughs> this, is, this is Germanic, right? I mean, all, all bets are off when you write things in German. Like the, they, have, they have letters we don't even use. I know, I'm, I live in Germany. I'm, I'm talking to you from Germany, I know, I'm married to one. Dear Lord. Um, but uh, facial scanning and facial, facial recognition, you're talking about people in Burger King in Brazil are using it. And you have a long list of these companies that are also using it, you know, Home Depot, Walmart. There's a list that you link to where you're trying to explain to people, well, this is what, they, do they know what they're doing with this stuff at this point? And what are the implications here? You know, so we don't know. So there's a, there are a lot of applications for identifying people. I mean, the goal of a face recognition system is to identify somebody. I mean, the reason Walmart wants it in their store is when you walk in, they want to know who you are. I mean, right now they want to know if you are a you know convicted shoplifter that has been banned from Walmart. But, you know, in the future, maybe not Walmart, but maybe uh, in a high-end store or an airline wants to know how good a customer you are, right? So the goal here is identification, and then uh, some kind of data analysis, like who are you? And then like, what do we know about you? And then some kind of discrimination. I don't mean that sort of in a racial way. I mean, they'd be able to treat you differently. If you walk into you know, a high-end department store and you are flagged as an important, rich customer, and they want the store to give you better service. They're gonna make more money and if you, go in and, you're, and you, your name had popped up and they pull up your income and you didn't make any money, they're gonna ignore you. I mean, that's kind of the, the end game here. 
we're not truly there yet, but a lot of data is being collected. Maybe Facebook has an enormous repository of tagged photos of people because we tag the photos then and we put them on Facebook. Um, uh, driver's license photos are uh, there are many states where that that information is sold. And uh, airlines, uh, Delta Airlines is right now trying to collect face scans. Uh, Clear does that. Uh, we mentioned it's a weird story in Brazil, and it is true that a Burger King was, they had some kind of face recognition app that would tell you if you look drunk or not. So that was the gimmick. They were scanning your face and giving you a free hamburger. Now, free hamburger for your face scan, you know, probably sounds pretty good if you are hungover, but probably not a good deal in the long term of your life. Yeah. But if you are hungover, you kind of want that hamburger. No, nothing better than careening drunk people into signing away their, you know, likeness. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know how this makes sense. <laughs> uh, but, well, it all ties into the implications of, like, you've also written extensively on the companies that are using this data and giving it over to law enforcement. Can you give us some examples of that? So bunches of examples. And, and you know, we, we talk about whether law enforcement get this data without a warrant, where they can compel companies to give them the data. In many cases, they can. They can just ask for it. And lots of companies are happy to comply. Some are, some fight. You know, Apple will fight warrants when they, when they feel it's warranted. And they won't give data without a warrant. But you know, I was recently reading about uh, one of the uh, genetic testing companies. I forget which one. And they give lots of data to the police. Uh, there are other companies that do license plate scanning. Lots of companies give data to the police upon request rather than upon a court order. This is complicated. Oh, right? you know, it is our data, but we don't have any rights to it. The company can do what they want. And the market tends not to reward this kind of privacy, mostly because it's hidden. Like you don't know this. Like when you pick which company you're gonna, you know, spit into a cup and send it to, so they can tell you uh, your ancestry. You probably don't look at their record of giving data to police. But maybe you should. But most people aren't. So here again is something we can use some some rules about. Jesus Christ! Now you know why I drive, Sorry. Bruce. Well, remember, don't go to Burger King unless you want a free uh, hamburger. <laughs> but it's in Brazil, not here. And okay. You're probably not in Brazil right now. Honestly, we, we do okay in Germany for privacy rules, but still, it's a slippery slope, and we're, every day we lose. And you have way better hamburgers. That's true. And schnitzel. And delicious sausages. Uh, you know, I, I would pay money right now. I would give you my face skin for a schnitzel right now. Would you? Oh, that's a bad idea, Bruce. Tell you what, I'll send you a bratwurst in the mail. <laughs> Schnitzels are delicious. Yeah, yeah. Don't get me. Oh, I've had many, many schnitzels and many a fine beers here in Germany. It's uh, <laughs> very nice. Um, look, I want to thank Bruce uh, Schneier for coming on. He'll be back, right? I'll be back. He'll be back on the program. After I get my bratwurst that was promised to me, <laughs> you all heard him. Um, uh, check out a hacker. Because sending team. meat internationally in the mail is always a good idea. Yeah, I'm an international meat smuggler. Uh, I think that's a <laughs> felony offense there. Uh, Hacker's mind. Probably is, actually. Chop meat across the border, I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's allowed. Yeah, the customs would get you. I think taxation on on meat. Uh, those dogs, those customs dogs, they are like they're trained to smell meat. I mean, it's like <laughs> that's the in their thing. blood. Yeah, that's the first thing they the go. The first for. thing, right, right, right. I mean, <laughs> like smelling drugs is advanced. Smelling meat is like they give it to the new dogs. You guys look for the meat. Yeah, yeah. those are the lucky dogs. Um, it's true. Uh, a hacker's mind how <laughs> the powerful bend society's rules and how to bend them back uh, many many good things coming out of Bruce always so check him out um, anything you want to add before we go nah, that was great it was a lot of fun thanks for having me alright bye everybody